I recently played a game which was very short but yet quite instructive. E4, C5. The Sicilian defense is Black's most successful opening against E4, scoring only slightly below 50%. This is amazing if you take into account that the benchmark is only 46%. Here are a couple of reasons for that. The Sicilian attracts strong players, which of course influences the statistics. This brings us to reason number two. Strong players are attracted by the fact that the Sicilian immediately creates imbalances. Instead of aiming for a solid equality, Black aspires a dynamic equilibrium. He is prepared to grant White some advantages if only he also gets some. These advantages enable Black to play for a win. The third reason is a consequence of reason number two. Many white players feel overwhelmed by the complexity of the open Sicilian and hence resort to one of the many substandard sidelines. Well, my opponent was ready for the challenge and he went for the open Sicilian by playing d4. Cd4, a knight takes a d4, knight f6, knight c3. A6, the Knight of Variation. The Knight of Variation is the most complex and most popular line in the universe of the Open Sicilians. It is a weapon of choice of the strongest players in the world and helped Bobby Fischer and Gary Kasparov to dominate the rest of the chess world. It would be natural to ask what makes the Knight of so special? Why might it be superior to other species of the Sicilian family? Well, my abstract answer would be it is a perfect synthesis of three principles. Flexibility, activity and harmony. These principles overlap and are related to each other. Let's start with flexibility. One of the tenets of flexibility is to differentiate between must moves and can moves. First play the must moves and adapt the can moves to the play of your opponent. Thus, you gain more information and give away less. It so happens that the move a6 is something you can call the smallest common denominator. It is very useful in any case. Well, Black postpones the decision upon many other of his potential developments. For instance, he doesn't tell White whether he plans to put the knight to c6 or d7. He doesn't yet give away the location, the future location of his queenside bishop. Will it go to b7 or d7 or to e6 for instance. He doesn't tell White what he's going to do with his e-pawn. Will the e-pawn move to e6, e5 or will it stay on e7 in case black plays g6 later. I once did it, in, well two times actually, in my knight of games. And of course, this is also linked with the development of the bishop f8. Will it go to e7 or to g7? Now let's come to activity. Nidov is a very active Sicilian because very often we play moves such as b5 or e5. And uh, this, of course, puts white under a lot of pressure. Now, what about harmony? Well, in the knight of, black preferably develops his knight to d7 instead of c6. This is harmonious in the context of playing the bishop to b7 after b5 and the rook 
to C8. Let's mark it in another color. Yes, let's mark it yellow. The knight is now red here. Okay. So you see, the knight on D7 does not interfere with a bishop on B7. It's not in his way. Also, the knight wouldn't be in the way of the rook. D7 also is a very interesting square because you not only defend the neuralgic point f6, you can also move the knight to e5 and farther to either c4 or g4. You can move the knight to c5, attacking e4, or to b6 in order to jump to c4. So the knight of is extremely flexible as you can see. Okay, that was quite a lot of abstract thinking. Now uh, let's move on with the game. My opponent played the most favorable, favorable maybe, but the most uh, popular line for white and it scores also pretty well. That's true. Bishop e3 overtook bishop g5 in the rankings by frequency. Now I played e6. Actually, already 27 years ago, I played the move e5 against Bologan. e5 and e6 are equivalent in value. Okay, in this game I played e6. This is the famous scavening center. I person personally consider this pawn structure, or what you can see here, as the most complex in the entire universe of chess. Well, that demands an explanation, I guess. First of all, the pawn structure is dynamic. It is not yet fixed. White has the options to play his f-pawn to either f3 or f4, which, of course, widens uh, the variety of potential positions or position, position types. Let's say white puts a pawn to, e, f, uh, to f4, right? So then white would be able to farther push pawns to e5, f5. Sometimes white put, pushes his g-pawn to g4. Black, on the other hand, can play e5 or d5 or first e5 and then d5. He can also play b5, of course, followed by d4. So there's a lot of dynamism going on. The structures are fluid. And if you play these positions with white or black, you have to prepare to anticipate all of these uh, substructures and sometimes even sub-sub or sub-sub substructures. Very complex. What also is complex is the value system uh, here uh, in this position. I mean the areas of the overall value system of chess which are um, relevant here. There are many openings where, for instance, king safety doesn't play a role. But of course in the Sicilian it does. Very often we have uh, castling links to uh, different uh, wings. Uh, we have attack and defense. We have, of course, all the rest as well, peace activity. We have different pawn structures. We have pawn weaknesses. We have weak squares. We have potentially good end games. We have bishop pairs, bishop pair situation arising. So we have the full bag of chess strategy here. That's why I think it's simply the most complex chess position type. Okay, my opponent played f4 and actually this is already a mistake. So in my annotations I attach a question mark to this move. This is already uh, a proof or let's say an indication that the knight of puts a lot of pressure on, on white. If 
white can already go astray by um, playing an, a normal looking move like f4. Why is this move bad? Well, the, the short answer would be it, it weakens the e4 pawn. What is better here? In this position, the main move is f3, <clears throat> followed by queen d2, queenside castling, and then g4, g5. It's uh, the English attack. This English attack can be seen in many different lines. Not only the knight of, but also uh, the Skaveningen and, and other Sicilians, like uh, the Taimanov. A different alternative would be the hyper-aggressive um, move G4, it's a called the Perini variation. Now black has nothing better than accepting the P sacrifice. E5 is pretty much the only move. White plays knight f5 and now g6. Now the knight cannot go back to g3 because the g4 pawn would uh, fall. So that is not the intention of anyone playing g4. The right move is of course g5 and after g takes f5, e takes f5, d5 and then later queen f3 uh, d4, we see a complete chaotic position on the board. Objectively, that's not a problem for black, but of course, black should rather know his way around. Okay, my opponent played f4. It's quite a harmless move. I play b5, um, referring to the um, activity part of the knight of variation. So I get active and of course b4 is now a threat as the e4 pawn is a bit soft without the support of the f pawn on f3. Bishop e3 developing the bishop defending the pawn. I play bishop b7 and we can also claim, uh, we can already claim equality here. The engine gives equality and you see black could play b5, which is not always the case in the Sicilian. He could play his bishop on a very active square and has already some kind of initiative going. Now, white played queen f3, mm, developing the queen, defending the pawn even more. Well, if I was white, I would uh, play differently here. So if I would play this line, which actually I wouldn't, then at least I would come up now with castle. Castling is better because if now black plays, like I did in the game, knight bd7, which by itself is a good move, white can answer with f5, e5, and now knight e6. <clears throat> this makes knight bd knight bd7 a mistake actually so now queen c8 is best and white has a slight advantage but let's see what happens if black takes the knight f takes e6 uh, okay knight c5 the knight has to move away of course bishop takes um, pawn takes bishop and now rook takes f6 that is the point so one very short line is queen f6 Bishop b5 check, a b, queen g7 checkmate. Well, yeah, in the Sicilian, sometimes bad things can happen very quickly. After rook f6, g f6 is the better move. Then we see queen h5 check, king e7, another check. The king goes on a small voyage. Rook d1, threatening bishop takes a b5 check, so the king has to move away, but the check comes nevertheless. Bishop takes a b, and after rook d8, white is already winning. Okay, let's go back to the move castles. In order to prevent this from happening, black would have to play queen c7, and then maybe knight bd7 next move.
but you don't always want to play the queen to c7, at least not that early. In the game I could do without queen c7 and could instead accelerate my development on the king side. So queen f3, it's a doubtful move because it allows knight bd7. Now f5 doesn't work. My opponent played a3 instead in order to prevent me from playing b4. This by itself is a reasonable move and we see it in many lines of the Sicilian but here it is very slow. So he should have castled instead and he should have allowed me to push b4 and now I guess knight b1 is the best move. And even here after white's best play um, black has the initiative and white has to work for equality actually. White will finally equalize in this position but has to play some accurate moves. Coming back to the game, a3. Now I play a very good move, g6. Bishop e7 is also possible with equality but g6 is better. So g6 yeah, well, with g6, I don't want to praise myself, but let's let's phrase it like that. I I display some kind of understanding of this position type, I would say, right? So the g6 move has two different goals. First of all, if you play e5 later on, you prevent the knight from jumping to f5. So it is a preparation of a future e5. My opponent castled, and now. I played bishop g7, which was the main idea of g6. What you see here is actually black's perfect development in this uh, Scaveningen type of uh, pawn structure. This is the perfect uh, minor piece setup. Why is a bishop so well placed on g7? Well, it also has to do with the pawn g6. As you can see, this pawn is blunting the attacking bishop d3. With the bishop on e7, very often the queen would move to h3 and then sometimes maybe we see something like e4, e5 and bishop and queen both converging on the square h7. This can lead to white attacking black's king. But now with the pawn on g6 being in the way of the bishop, there is no attack happening anymore. So what about this position? I think black is slightly better and actually the engine is supporting me with this verdict. Why is that? I mean, this is move 11 and I claim a slight black advantage already. The reason is, the reason for, for this assessment is that in the Sicilian, white normally has a dynamic advantage. White has more space and a higher di a degree of peace activity. He has uh, to have this in order to compensate black's better pawn structure. Black has two center pawns opposed to only one in, in white's camp. Also white has an exposed pawn on e4. Then let's have a look at the queen side. There you see this majority of white. It's quite inactive. It's dominated by black's b5 pawn. So black has a better pawn majority. Also black has the better king safety as white has moved his f pawn already two moves or two squares to f4 let's have a look at this as there is no pawn which could let's say move to f3 anymore the bishop had a view to the white's pawn cover here in case uh, the e4 pawn vanishes. It can be exchanged or let's say if it moves forward or it's going to be exchanged by d65. The bishop has a nice view 
on the square G2. And sometimes in the Sicilian, something is happening in the C file and a major piece might arrive at C2. Then we have already two pieces converging on the square G2. So this king here on G1 is quite exposed. Also on the A7 G1 diagonal, some uh, accident might happen. So often the king moves to H1, but this still leaves the square F2 very weak. Maybe a knight will appear there later. Knight G4, knight F2 check. This is what we see every day happening in the Sicilian. Also with the king on H1, white suddenly would have a, a, a first rank problem. There could be a mate on the first rank in some lines. So, um, the bottom line is that white normally needs his initiative, his higher degree of peace activity and attacking potential in order to compensate for black's static, long-lasting advantages with regard to the pawn structure. But here, these dynamic advantages don't exist any longer. That's why black is slightly better. Now my opponent played rook ae1. Uh, maybe not the best move. I castle. Queen h3 happened now in order to unpin the e-pawn. Let's have a look at a different line. King h1, this is a move which is often played. I would have continued with rook c8 maybe. Um, of course the rook is very strong in the c file. We all know this potential exchange sacrifice which can happen in case you can afterwards grab the e4 pawn. Queen h3, now this sacrifice would be premature because after rook c3, b c3, knight e4, White has knight takes e6, takes, 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 and queen e6, check. But generally this rook c3 idea is quite strong. The best move, however, here is knight c3, conservative play, attacking the e4 pawn. It's also a reason why the knight is so well placed on d7, as I mentioned earlier. Now, White has to play f5 in order to solve the problem with the e4 pawn. e takes f5, e5, rook e8. And in this position, black already has a clear advantage. Look at uh, the e-file. We have a soft spot here. The bishop might be taken anytime. g2 is weak. Now you can see it clearly visible. The e4 square is weak. White's, White's king doesn't feel really comfortable where it is. So, and look at Black's bishop. They are both fine cattle. So they, they are owning the long diagonals. The knights are very active, the rooks are uh, active. That uh, results in a clear advantage for Black. Now, after castles, my opponent played queen h3. Also a standard move, unpinning the e-pawn. I play e5, that was a good move. I, I break this um, dynamic pawn formation here. A typical device into Sicilian by exchanging uh, the e-pawn with the f-pawn. You isolate white's e-pawn and you deprive white's pawns of their dynamic potential. So here white played knight f3, if, if instead f takes e5, I would have played the novelty, maybe, well, I, I don't know. Yeah, this was my intention, I can tell you. Uh, anyways, um, to, to play knight takes e5. I love this knight on e5. I, I don't like a d takes e5 so much, though I surely would have played like that. The knight, of course, is here on a tremendous outpost where it is radiating in many directions. And you see here the e4 pawn is quite weak. 
So that is very good. Let's say white plays knight f3. Um, knight fg4 is a strong move, attacking the bishop e3. Knight e5 is forced, knight e5. Let's say rook d1. On e1 the rook was positioned quite inefficiently. Rook c8. So there's some pressure now on the c-file. You see the bishop g7 is affecting the knight and so is the rook here. Also this, the pawn here behind the knight can become weak later and then we have that weak e4 pawn as well. Now what can white do? Queen g3 might be a reasonable move and after rook e8 I, I would claim a slight advantage for black. Let's see what happens if white plays a mistake here. White plays bishop h6. That's a blunder. Bishop takes bishop, queen takes bishop, bishop uh, knight g4, queen f4, and now we have this check. I was referring to that earlier. I told you that the king is not very comfortably placed on the a7 g1 diagonal and here you see a good, a good example for that. Let's return to the game. After e5 my opponent played knight f3. I took on f4, bishop f4, queen c7. So now I play the queen to c7 defending the pawn. My opponent played king h1. An alternative idea would be the aggressive bishop h6. This is what many black players would have uh, a lot of respect for maybe. This is a well-known formation. You play uh, bishop h6, knight g5 and then finally you want to give checkmate on h7 but in order to do so you first have to get rid of the defending knight. And that's not that easy. The typical exchange sacrifice rook f6 doesn't really work because the knight is protected by a reserve player on d7. So rook a8 would be best and black is actually clearly better here. What can white do? Let's say queen h4, rook e7. In order to double rooks, the e4 pawn is very weak in this structure. Knight g5, that is the idea, right? But now black can simply play rook fe8, let's say rook e2, intending to double on the f-file, maybe finally to perform the double exchange sack on f6. Queen c5, king h1, rook e5, and actually this is dissolving this cluster here on the king side because the threat as you see is bishop takes h6 followed by rook takes g5 so white has to abandon his attack has to take on g7 the knight has to retreat and now you see white is left with a weak pawn with a bad bishop the c pawn the c2 pawn sometimes is also weak and don't forget that in such structures black sometimes can play b4 and after a b queen takes b4 there is also some potential attack against the b pawn so white's, ma white's, white's majority on the queen side actually uh, instead of being um, an asset very often is a liability because black can perform the typical sicilian minority attack Let's return to the game. Queen c7, king h1. This was uh, the move of my opponent. And now I, I played, I would say after playing flawlessly for, for 15 moves, I, I, I played a mistake here. I made a mistake. I played rook f e8. Well, I wouldn't particularly call this uh, a crime. Uh, so it's not it's not such a bad move but much better would have been rook a8 this rook belongs to e8 here instead of the king's rook let's go through a, a line here queen h4 knight h5 bishop g5 
knight c5. Now white's position is under strong pressure. White cannot do anything active here like g4 because I would take on c3, bc3 and now f6. This is uh, winning actually for black. Well, I don't want to go too much into detail here in this video. Um, after bishop c5, knight c5, king g1, which is a waiting move, but white can only wait actually. And now uh, black could play h6, bishop e3 and now f5. And this is the reason why the rook is better placed on f8. I mean the queen's rook. So this of course is not so good here. We need the rook on f8. That's why rook a8 was better, giving me a clear advantage here. For instance, e takes f5, knight takes bishop cd, rook f5, knight e4, because the strong bishop b7 has to be neutralized. And now black can liquidate like this. And the e4 pawn is very soft. For instance, queen g4, king h7, bishop d2, rook e6, b4, check. Queen c6, now the pawn is under attack. Knight h4, queen c2, rook e2, queen d3. Clear advantage black. This is the result of an engine analysis. Let's go back to the game. Rook f8, um, putting some more pressure against the e-pawn. Now my bishop, uh, my bishop, my opponent made a mistake by sacrificing his bishop. That's why I said bishop on b5. Well, that was maybe also the result of psychological pressure because this position is slightly better for black and white has absolutely no prospects here. In such situations, uh, people tend to overreact, lose their patience and maybe resort to drastic measures like my opponent did by playing bishop takes b5. What would have been better here? Let's uh, have a look. Queen h4 looks like a reasonable move. The queen is more active on h4 because potentially the, the point f6 can be put under some pressure here. My answer would be here in the analysis. Knight c5, bishop g5, knight f to d7. So the knight can simply move away because the queen's knight the queen's knight vacated the square one move earlier. Now let's say white resorts to his actually only attacking plan in the structure. We, we had a look at this before. Now maybe it works in this position because there is no knight on f6 anymore which can defend the neuralgic point h7. Takes, takes, knight e5. Now if, oh no, I jumped here. To the wrong spot. So 95, this is where we were, right? 95. Now, if knight g5 threatening something evil on h7, we can simply play f6. Rook f6 doesn't work because of knight g4. So the queen from g7 defends this h7 pawn. So white actually is slightly worse. Black has the better minor pieces and the better pawn structure. We see a weak pawn here, and we see a bad bishop. That's a perfect Sicilian for black. But as I mentioned, my opponent took on b5. Maybe it was desperation because he, he couldn't see any other plan. And as I told you, there wasn't any very constructive plan. White could only have waited uh, what black would do. So bishop b5, question mark, a b5, knight b5, this bishop sacrifice, by the way, is a standard motive in the Sicilian. Um, sometimes it's strong, but in this case it isn't. Now queen c6 is another good move I have available, but I think I played the best move here by capturing the c2 pawn. Knight takes d6. That was the idea. Black is faced with an attack on his rook, the bishop and also the potential threat of e5. 
The knight f6 cannot really move away so well in many occasions because the queen maybe takes then on d7. So a couple of problems here, but my answer was quite convincing. I just sacrificed the exchange. It's easy to sacrifice something if you want something beforehand. So I gave something back uh, by taking uh, the pawn. So there's also no future e4, e5 push anymore. Now, white cannot take my bishop because then I take his bishop on f4. What can white do? The best move would have been knight takes e4, accepting the sacrifice, bishop e4. And actually the engine um, estimates this position as being 4.5 pawns better for me. So I'm clearly winning here according to the engine. So we have some weak pawns here and we have this soft spot. So the king has some problems. The bishop is very strong on e4. And uh, looking at the mat material only might suggest that black is doing okay, but it's not, not a big thing here, but it's about peace activity, um, king safety and weak pawns. That's why I'm clearly winning here. Nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, this is what my opponent should have done. Instead, he played the blunder bishop g5. The reason is that he was now down to only five minutes on his clock and uh, maybe was not really uh, content with the position after uh, knight takes e4, bishop e4. Now he played bishop g5, attacking the bishop b7. So because now I could not take on f4 anymore with my rook. But my answer is now quite easy. I just take on e1 and now he cannot take with the knight. Maybe that was his initial idea, attacking my queen, attacking the bishop b7. But I simply play queen e2, attacking his rook on f1, winning. So in the game he recaptured then with the rook and I played bishop d5. And as now everything is well defended, also the, the pawn f7 by my bishop, my opponent did the right thing and resigned. I hope I could uh, uh, inform you about some um, specialties of the Sicilian defense. I hope I, hope I could make you a, a better Sicilian player if you already were some. Um, well, then let's uh, meet in the next video and uh, give me a like if you learned something here. Bye-bye.